Well, we've finished looking at negative feedback mechanisms. Let's take a look now at positive feedback mechanisms. And the, this is again related to that homeostatic control mechanism that I introduced to, to you, you two in an earlier video. Positive feedback mechanisms are very different from negative feedback mechanisms in that they are typically short-lived and if they do not stop after a short while, they can be dangerous and deadly as a matter of fact. Ironically, we can't live without them either, so they must occur. So this is the difference between a negative and a positive feedback mechanism. Once again, we're going to start with some kind of a stimulus that causes the body to deviate from its homeostatic condition, from this balance that we try to uh, maintain. What happens, though, in a positive feedback mechanism is that the response is going to be such that we're going to deviate further and further away from our balance point. And so this is what we're st starting to see happening. And you can see that this cannot go on endlessly. This has to stop or, or else we would possibly get very ill or die, like I said earlier. A very good example of a positive feedback mechanism is childbirth. There are others. You will learn in AMP2 about blood clotting. That is also a very good example of a positive feedback mechanism. Uh, inflammation. Um, but let's take a look at childbirth. Um, it's an easy to understand mechanism um, for all of you at this point in AMP. So when a little baby is getting close to being born, it is going to start pushing with its little head against the neck of the uterus. We call that the cervix. I'll just give you some keywords here so that you can better understand what I'm referring to. And when this stimulus occurs, namely the baby pushing against the cervix, the receptors in the uterus are going to now convey that information, oh, that baby is starting to stretch uh, the uterine wall, uh, and that information now makes it to the control center. Remember, the control center includes usually the brain and the spinal cord, but in this case, it is going to be, and so I'm putting this in parentheses, our control center is going to be a major gland, which we call the pituitary gland. So it's not always the central nervous system that functions as a control center. In this case, it's going to be a gland. And what's going to happen is that this gland is going to respond by releasing a hormone. And that hormone is called oxytocin. And oxytocin, which some of you might have been given to induce childbirth, at, birth, at which time it's often called pitocin, the oxytocin will now flow in the bloodstream and eventually reach the smooth muscles of the uterus. And remember, all muscles and all glands can function as effectors. So in this case, the smooth muscles of the uterus are going to be our effectors. And consequently, they begin to contract. That causes our baby to push even harder against the cervix, which causes the release of even more oxytocin. And this causes even more contraction of smooth muscles, such that our receptors are going to continue sending signals to that pituitary to continue releasing oxytocin. Now, how long does this keep going? This will keep going until the baby is born. At that time, there is no more baby pushing against the cervix anymore, and consequently, we don't see the, the, the stimulus needed to get the pituitary gland to release oxytocin. And the whole positive feedback mechanism stops. So again, what we're seeing happening is that because the baby is pushing against the cervix, we ultimately see that smooth muscles are going to contract, causing even more pushing of the baby. And that causes even more contraction, which allows for the baby to come 
to, to continue um, um, making its path through the uterus, through the vagina, to eventually be born. And so this is why we call this a positive, positive feedback mechanism. So the moment the baby is born, this will eventually all come back to homeostatic conditions. And so once again, in a positive feedback mechanism, we see that the ultimate result or response is going to be such that it augments the initial stimulus. It enhances the initial stimulus. This is totally the opposite of what we saw in negative feedback, where we found that the response was working opposite the stimulus. So be sure that you can compare the two. There aren't a whole lot of examples of positive feedback mechanisms, um, unlike negative feedback mechanisms, of which you will see many, many throughout AMP1, AMP2, pathophysiology 1 and 2, and even other classes in health occupations. Till next time.